Hello, morning Simon enjoyers and hieroglyph enjoyers. I am coming to you with a, uh, it's, it's most definitely a keyboard. This is the Helix Aru 65, which is a six degree angle, 65% with about a 20.5 millimeter front height. It's very reminiscent of the Aru TKL. Uh, hopefully you remember that. If not, I have uh, a review on it. Uh, so if you enjoy hieroglyphs from the Rosetta Stone, you will definitely enjoy this one. Uh, it's got a potentiometer slider in the place of the 65% expansion keys. And you can also have a blocker there in case you like wasting space even more. Uh, this version here is... Uh, well, this version here is the Divine Edition, which means that the raised hieroglyphs are anodized in a different color than the base color, which is quite cool. Uh, this version here has an alu plate and is hot swap, hence the uh, normie bottom row, but solder variants are also available. And uh, it comes in a lot of cool colors. Uh, the coolest colors being the uh, Divine Editions, uh, so those are the ones with, you know, the, the golden engravings. Uh, but the rest of them are pretty cool. The base model comes in at about $430, which is not bad. And the Divine Edition comes in at around $580, which is also not bad. And we'll discuss why. So, yeah, uh, this is a board that uh, made me feel a lot of feelings. And we're going to talk about those feelings. And we're going to tell stories and uh, they'll be passed down through the ages, maybe written on rocks. So yeah, intro. Ow, how are, how are their ham hairs? I literally just put this desk mat on. Hello. Let's start with the unboxing experience. I will try and not repeat myself too much. You guys should all know how I feel about not having a hard case. So this doesn't have a hard case. Uh, there is a little sleeve uh, that is in the shape of the Rosetta Stone, which is the inspiration for this board. So this sleeve is made out of plastic, aka the worst kind of garbage. And inside of that, we have our box, which is a nice matte black cardboard box, also known as garbage. It's fairly simple. Uh, the uh, the text on it is actually in a gold color, like foil. And there is information on the spec over here. So you've got black, ivory, safari, wild card, and Simon. And in the divine edition, you have black, silver, and wild card. Now, before continuing any further, uh, this is a review unit. It was sent to me specifically for review. I don't get to keep it. It needs to go back. Uh, whether or not I will purchase an actual group buy unit, I'll discuss later in this video, but, uh, it's yes, I'm going to be purchasing one. Okay. So let's, let's open up the box. It's a lot easier to do when there's a board inside there. Mm. All right, here we are. And the first layer is where your plate and PCB go. As soon as you lift that up, you've got a bunch of cat hairs inside. Yes, those do come standard. This is an Egyptian board. So you get your board in here and you get your little tools in there. So. That's basically it. It's nice, it's tight, it's compact. It just works. Cool. Now, the really, 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 really nice to have a hard case. As a matter of fact, a hard case is a requirement if you buy a board like this. Uh, because I tried to take this to work in a sleeve, and I was so terrified, I just held on to it all the way to the office and back. It terrified the hell out of me. And considering that uh, this pre-production unit uh, had an issue with uh, the scarab just flying off, 
I know I'm pulling very hard. That's because I have shimmed it, which we'll discuss why later. But if I don't shim it, and it just sits in there, and you're just walking around with your board. Oh, look, the scarab fell off. Oh, no, where is it? So, yeah. Uh, if you get one of these, absolutely pick up a hard case. The Canon Keys 65% cases are fantastic. They do a great job. They're like big cases. They're way bigger than the board itself. But if you're going to pick up a Divine Edition, definitely pick up a hard case. If you don't already have hard cases. So, uh, yeah, I guess uh, I guess we'll go through the externals. Uh, because this board is all about the externals. You'll also have to excuse me because it's still early for me. A lot of you said, Simon, we like all the light in your room. It's nice when there's light in your room. Yeah, it sure is. Mm. Alrighty, so let's start at the top. The top, we have our, basically our two-layer machined, all of these uh, gold bits actually sit up higher, just like they did on the original Aru, but they are anodized in gold, whereas the base color is black. Uh, there are other colors, uh, like gold and purple giggle. Unfortunately, uh, those, at least in terms of the communication so far, uh, are mystery, raffle, gotcha, bamboozle, uh, uh, sales model. So if you like the purple Divine Edition, you can't buy one, apparently. Uh, fun fact, this is one of the first keyboards of all time where my review is actually going to come out before the group buy. So expect the group buy in a few days. Uh, if uh, it's still like a mystery raffle gotcha bamboozle edition, uh, that is the technical term, uh, please voice your concerns and just be like, bro, I want to buy the purple one, or I want to buy, buy the blue one, or I want to buy the red one. Just let me buy it. So yes, very nice in terms of engravings, very nice in terms of finishing. Uh, I have the Normie bottom row here because this is a hot swap variant, but if uh, I were to pick one up, uh, I'd obviously go solder. So that's the top. Here we have ourselves a slider. This is a potentiometer slider, not a like digital slider. This is analog. And as a result, this doesn't do shit when it comes to QMK or VIA because we don't have the firmware support for it. Yay. So uh, we'll get to that later. But kind of wasteful, like eating so much space of a 65%. Uh, you do have the option of having a blocker here uh, in place of a slider for some reason. Uh, to be fair though, the slider is problematic and was the cause of a lot of my problems, which we will also discuss later. So let's have a look at the side profile. There we go. It is a wedge. Uh, I should probably get a thing to wipe this keyboard with. All right. There we go. So look at that. Very, very basic wedge shape, at least from the side, right? But if we get up in there, we can at least see, you know, we got little chamfer on the bottom, small little chamfer on the top. So, you know, at least, at least they're trying. All right, here's the back, which uh, if, you, if you can't tell by my fingerprints, uh, it's PVD. Let's clean that up. All right, so we see there are actually two pieces here in the back. There is the very shiny PVD piece, but there is additionally a gold piece here that has more hieroglyphs on it. Here, let me let me show it to you on the macro cam. So check that out. So these are two separate parts. The bottom part is a, I assume, a brass PVD, and above that is aluminum with the hieroglyphs on it. Camera. Thank you. So I'll check that out. It's very, very cool. And we'll talk about what those parts actually do when we look at the internals. Uh, while we're here at the back, we do see the port. 
Uh, the port is inset, but not too inset. I personally had some issues with the port. Now, you know, I have my, I have my, I test every board with this cable cable, but not really a fair. Oh my, oh my, oh my God. Oh my God. I just dipped this in my coffee. Oh no. Oh no. Giggle. Okay, well, uh, so I've got this cable here that I use for a lot of my testing and I had an issue with it where it wouldn't go all the way in. So I push it all the way in, it's not in. I push it all the way in, it's not in. The, uh, the USB port sits just like a millimeter and a half to two millimeters too far in for something like this. Now, using a normal USB-C cable that like comes with a phone or whatever works just fine. It's just the dimensions of this particular one isn't great, but like having having a port inset just that much is kind of annoying. It means that this portion of your USB-C cable needs to be longer than average. And, you know, for a lot of custom cable jobs, especially considering that, you know, this particular head is a fairly common head when it comes to aftermarket, like nice coiled cables. This just won't work. So, yeah. Alrighty. And finally, the back, and of course the scare flies out. All right, back is fairly simple, or the bottom, pardon. This is the back, this is the bottom. We got four feet. We will check out those feet. Uh, we've got one big weight, which is, uh, it's a shiny boy. So there are two weight options when uh, you purchase this board. Uh, one of the weight options uh, looks like a standard scarab and the other one looks like a standard scarab where the sun is explode. I like the explode. It looks very cool. It looks very, very cool. So in terms of heft, the board is honestly decently hefty and we can go ahead and weigh it, see what it actually weighs. It's about just shy of 1700 grams, 1 1.7 kilos built. Now, of course, your version may differ because you might be using thinner caps or heavier caps or uh, a different scarab, which we'll talk about. Uh, yeah, but feels decently hefty. It's nice. Uh, it's nice. Honestly, it's nice. From a design standpoint, I really like the board. I like the original board. Why would I not like this one? It's fantastic. So yeah, that's basically the externals. Let's check out those feats. So these are rubber adhesive strip feet. So let's check that out. Let me grab my, <clears throat> my foot touching tool, if I can find it. Any feet touchers? Ah, there it is, all right. So. Here we are. It's just, it's just rubber. Not a huge amount of deformation. It's relatively hard. This looks like 70A, 80A. Wait, it's about 80A hardness. And they simply adhere into place. I'm not gonna pull it up because that would ruin the adhesive. Now, generally, I'm more of a fan of feet that, you know, will pop in or will, uh, like, uh, pressure fit in, not necessarily adhere, but it's fine. Honestly, it's fine. Uh, you can also see that it does pick up a lot of dust in that area, considering the bottom is completely flat when you're moving this along your desk, which to be fair, the feet do a really good job of preventing you from moving it. But when you do move it around, you will pick up a little bit of dust on the feet. It happens. It happens to the best of us. Uh, the amount of force required to move it up and down is about, about 1.9 kilos up and down and a bit less, about 
1.6, 1.7 to move it left to right. This is on a desk mat, on a wooden table. It's not going anywhere. So yeah, it's uh, it's it's definitely a keyboard that I enjoy, except for this part, which we will talk about. I keep saying that there's a lot to talk about once we get into the uh, interior. The interior is uh, a little bit wild. Uh, <clears throat> Let me have some coffee. Ah. All right, I'm gonna start opening it up. Am I still missing the correct size? Now I got it. It is a 2.0, a hex 2. So <clears throat> I have taken apart this board about five times so far. And uh, it is uh, not an enjoyable experience when you have to do it five times. It There's a learning curve. It becomes easier after like the second or third disassembly. But then again, everything becomes easier after you've done it a couple times. But it is kind of annoying to do. Uh, considering that this is a hot swap board, we will actually be doing a full disassembly, which is nice. Now, uh, the weight doesn't come installed when you, uh, when you get it originally, considering there are two weight options, and I assume from a logistics point of view, it's easier to just not assemble the weights and just ship you the one that you wanted. It's fine, honestly. All right, here we go. <clears throat> the screws are out, but we're still not going to review them. Alrighty, so let's open it up. There we go. We got ourselves a bottom. It's essentially, it's perfectly flat bottom. We'll talk about <clears throat> the implications of that. And uh, basically the top is where all the business is happening. So I guess we're going to have to take it apart. So let's go for it. Now, this is a mounting method that you've probably never seen. So this is gasket, but I took the bottom off and it's still fine. But Simon, how is it gasket? Well, there is this piece here and these pieces here that essentially clamp to the top that sandwich the PCB plate assembly between two rubber gummy snakes. Now let's go ahead and take it apart. So this top piece is purely decorative, by the way. This bit right here. Now, one thing that I did notice on this bit right here, prior to moving forward, is... Let's clean that real quick. I did notice that there were visible machining marks in here. Now, give me one second. You see that? You see the, the lines? So, that is an indication that the inside, just the inside, this is not an issue on the outside, uh, the inside edge was not polished enough. So... Normally, after you machine apart, you'll uh, you'll pan polish, you'll sandblast, and then you'll do the finishing. Uh, in this case, it's PVD, PVD. I don't know if they do sandblast or not, but the fact that the outside is totally fine, the inside is not, means that the inside was not well polished. Uh, this is something that I did relay to Helix, but uh, we'll talk about that in a bit. All right, so daughter board basically sits on this PVD piece, which uh, honestly, from its weight, I can't really tell if it's brass or not. Seems like it's brass. Don't you dare. Don't you dare in the comments. I know exactly what you're going to say. All right. The daughter, the daughter board cable actually goes in in a very interesting manner, but I'm still not going to talk about that. All right. So we've taken that bit off and it's still mounted. So we essentially have this bar here. So this bar which is screwed in at four points, and these three things that are 
screwed in at six points, make the mounting structure. So what I like to do, considering I've done this a few times, is do all but one, just to make sure that the assembly doesn't go anywhere. Uh, it is it is notable that every single screw is M2, which is great, considering how much of a pain in the ass this is to assemble and disassemble. All right, so now we're going to pull off these clamps, I call them. So there we go. So these apply pressure downwards, and that captures the little gaskets in there. But we're still not talking about those. All right, let's finally take it apart. There we go. And the last one here. And there we go. It has fallen apart. You heard a thunk. That was the board thunking. All right. So now we can pull off the plate PCB assembly. Perfect. And we are left with the top and the bottom, which is what we'll go through right now. Oh, yeah. All right, but prior to that, it's time for a very particular part of this review. You know it, you love it. It's screwing time. All right, so in order, these are the external case screws. So we've got long screws in the back, short screws in the front. The gold plating on these is not great, because you can see that it's starting to rub off a little bit on the knurled edges. Uh, alternatively, uh, the knurled edges just might be that color because I noticed that most of the screws kind of look that way. So those are the case screws. Then we have the decorative bar assembly screws right here, which are all short length. Again, all M2 all knurled. Then we have the, uh, the, the mounting top bar screws, all four of equal length. So these are the ones that actually apply pressure, keeping the assembly closed. And then finally, we have the front side, which for some reason are not knurled and are not the correct color and look completely different. Yeah, uh, this will definitely be changed in group by because I have already complained thoroughly. It's very, very silly having a themed board in which the theme is Egypt and gold and divine. And, you know, you've, you've got all these wonderful, wonderful gold screws. And then you give me this. For the record, even the screws on the daughter board are gold. Yet you give me this. What is this? What is this? Anyway, screw anger aside, let's take a look at the bottom piece. All right, so here's the bottom. The bottom is flat, completely flat, 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 flat. You got a little inset here where the the uh, the decorative rear bar sits. So when I say decorative rear bar, I mean this one. Yes, it does hold the daughter board, but it's entirely decorative to the mounting. And we've got a small little cutout where the daughter board screws will not conflict with the case. Okay, fine. Uh, we got an engraving here designed by Helix Lab 2022. Giggle. And uh, that's pretty much it with the bottom. So let's see if we can pull out this, uh, this weight. If I remember correctly, it was a different screw size. Okay, so this is 2.0. Yeah, it's not 2.0. Okay. So it's probably a 1.5. Let's look for a 1.5. What are you? 
Nope. 0 0.7, 0 0.9, 2.5. Wait, does 1.5 not exist? All right. I got my backup tools. Oh, there it is. Hex 1.5. It was indeed a 1.5. All right. So four screws hold this together, if I remember correctly. Uh, please note that the screws are gold, and they are countersunk. So they sit flush once fully screwed into place. So weight should just pop out. Yep, just pops out. And here is the weight. It's kind of wild. So it's two pieces. I do not recall if this is brass or steel. This is, give me a second. That's steel. So it's two PVD pieces. You've got the inner gold PVD piece and then the outer silver PVD piece. Pretty cool. So the silver outer piece should be the same for everyone. And then basically it's the inner piece that's physically different depending on which one you buy. I do like this design. It is very cool. And it is very, very shiny. You can tell how shiny it is because you can see my eyes. So yeah, and that basically just drops into place, screws in with M1.5 countersunk screws. It's very, really simply, there's a tiny little bit of wiggle, but once it's screwed in, there should be no wiggle to speak of. So we'll just do the two corners just for sanity checking, but I never had any weird like movement sounds. Yeah, that's not going anywhere. While this case was assembled. So let's close this up real quick. Uh, as is customary, by the way, yes, yes, they sent me a black unit because uh, I have lovely hands that uh, totally do not uh, destroy black. So yeah, thank you for sending me black. I love black, Just all the black. So anyway. A uh, single piece of aluminum. Uh, this is 6063 aluminum, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it's very unlikely that it's 61. I'm not going to be able to tell the sonic difference between 61 and 63. But yeah, bottom is very, very simple. Uh, we've got uh, basically eight screw taps inside. And the screw taps, if we look very closely, are not straight taps. Uh, they have a little ledge, so I'll show you that. All right, so when the screw goes in, it actually makes contact with this part of the top case, sorry, this part of the bottom case, pushing the bottom case into the top case. The alternative method would be to basically just do a straight tap where it's just all the way through and the screw would not necessarily interfere with this part, but it's fine. Uh, more or less, this is a relatively standard way of dealing with it. Uh, normally, these uh, little ledges are just further in, but this is a really thin piece, so it's kind of easy uh, easy to notice on this. But yeah, that's the, that's the bottom. Uh, one thing you may have noticed, besides my terrible, terrible fingerprints, is that this is a perfectly flat bottom. And if you've ever seen a high-end board, or you've been around the block a few times, and you've you've seen, you know, you've seen keyboard designs like these, where the bottom is just completely flat, you notice that they sound kind of echoey, kind of pingy, kind of bad, okay, is like the general catch-all term. Uh, the, the reasoning behind this is, you know, uh, when you're typing, you have uh, the sound that will disperse through the case, and you've got the sound that will be emitted through the air from the plate PCB assembly. And if it's going to hit a, fl a perfectly flat surface, it's going to come straight back at you like a mirror. And essentially, it'll sound echoey or pingy, or it, it's basically just going to reflect whatever issues you have in your actual, like, you know, plate PCB assembly right back to you. Is that something really noticeable here? A little bit. We'll cover that later once we get to sound, feel, and story time. But for now, just keep a mental note that the bottom piece is essentially basically flat, which is kind of a no-no. Like, if you look at nicer boards and you look at like the internal uh the internal brass weights they'll have a little bit of texture on them they'll they'll have something going on 
All right. Next, we look at the top. So this is the top case. This is this is where all the business is. Now, earlier, when we talked about the pricing for the Divine Edition, I said that that price was actually pretty good. But why would I say that? Why is $580 an acceptable price for something like this? Well, if you look at uh, high-end anodization suppliers that can actually do two-layer anodization, which is what this is, the bottom layer is black, the top layer is gold. Uh, two-layer anodization on even a piece as small as this, as small as this, is five, six, seven hundred dollars just for the anodization, whereas this entire board is about five hundred and eighty. Obviously, Helix has found a methodology that is, you know, more financially feasible. So I'm certain that they're not paying hundreds of dollars for the dual-layer anodization, but in terms of you know, comparison, we do have to be fair and understand that stuff like this is not easy to do. Therefore, the price is fair. I mean, you can tell the base price for the standard one is 430 bucks and it's 430 bucks. Let's let's not forget this entire top is fully engraved. Every single protrusion protrudes all the way through the case, the case top at the very least. Which, again, I respect it, you know? Uh, you may not be a fan of the design, in which case, I, you, you're like 40 minutes into this video, you crazy person. But it is nice. If, like, whether or not you enjoy it, there is a degree of complexity and, you know, awe when you look at it. All right, so this is the top case. The top case has a bit more going on. So we can see divots. So these are six little rails for the six little gaskets. Now those gaskets are these, these are gummy snake. That is the terminology. Uh, the other acceptable terminology is hot dog. Uh, gummy snake implies that the snake goes all the way around and eats its butt. Uh, hot dog implies it's just a hot dog. So technically this is hot dog mount. Uh, we'll talk about the mount in a bit. Anyway, hot dog. So we've got our place for that and we've got our mounting points for the mounting rail so this bit here and the mounting clamps which go down there so mounting clamps have two screw two screws each for a total of six screws and the top mounting bar has a total of four screws that screw directly into the top case uh, while we're here we can also see the case screws that are here here and some other places. All right, uh, we see our little uh, little blocker there, very cute, and we see two little screws that actually fit the. Ooh, those are those are actually smaller than one point five. So that fits this little bit here because you do have the option of going with a uh, decorative badge blocker instead of having a slider here. Which, to be fair, considering the functionality deficit of the slider, maybe might be worth it. All right. So, actual top case design. We see, again, it is a wedge, but with a hole missing. Uh, kind of weird to do it this way, but fine. You know, I understand what they were trying to do from a design standpoint. It works. And then there's some, uh, there's some interesting bits here. There's uh, this, and uh, I don't know what this is, but I can feel a small little texture here that leads me to believe this exists to, uh, I don't know, uh, prevent collision, prevent scraping. Uh, that actually does look like it's anodized it could be used as an indication if the uh the anodization is the correct color i have no idea what these are uh which is really weird because i've spoken to helix about like everything and i forgot to ask what are these so here let me let me show you what these look like just so you get an idea so it's just a a piece of the same material that is anodized differently and then there's a weird little texture on part of it you can see there 
Kind of looks like a sticker or whatever. So I'm not sure what's going on there. So if you know what that is, so there are four of them, then go for it. Uh, obviously, they were hooked from that point. Maybe this is like, I don't know, part of the uh, dual layer anodization process. Like I can see what looks like very, very, very basic hook marks. But then that means it was hooked like this, which then means how do you anodize this a different color than this? I have no idea. I have no idea how the methodology works. And to be fair, most anodizing or complex anodizing like methodology is kept relatively secret because they don't, they don't want us to know the truth. So there we are. All right, so that's basically the top and bottom. So let's look at the remaining pieces. So top and bottom, basically just leave a little gap in here. So what's in the gap? So part one, which is the part closest to the top is this. You'll remember this was the one that had the that had the struggle focusing, there we go. The one that had a little bit of hieroglyphs. And this is essentially used to mount the plate assembly to the top. We see here that it uses two small gaskets per side on this side. And on the top side, it uses one large gasket for each of these. So one large hot dog. So big hot dog right there. And on this side, two small hot dog. Uh, why is this? There's actually a reason. We'll get to that. And then finally, we have our purely decorative back piece, which is just PVD. We've got our <clears throat> USB-C cutout. Now, I've spoken to Helix and requested that uh, this USB-C connector could theoretically be moved forward about like a millimeter without, without impacting like the design at all. And he said he would look into it. Maybe it will help with cable compatibility. So we see that the daughter board is screwed into this decorative piece. And we see that the daughter board basically is a fully custom daughter board. Uh, we've never seen a daughter board like this. The uh, uses a ribbon cable and the ribbon cable comes in perpendicular to the daughter board itself. So it comes straight out and uh, it's a yeah, it's uh, it's a it's a very weird connector which uh, we'll talk about soon. So that is the entirety of the K6 journals minus this. This is the scarab. This little bugger, get it, bugger, uh, was the source of a lot of problems, which we're still not going to talk about yet. But let's look at the design. There's our scarab. It's very cute. On the back end, has a little bone shape or eye shape or H shape. And what that does is it fits onto the little slider assembly of the slider. It's pretty cool. Conceptually, very, very cool. Looks very pretty. Uh, so this just kept falling off my board all the time because it was not like, there was nothing really keeping it in place. Now, reminder that this is a pre-production version. And although a Chinese uh, group buy has already happened, uh, there might be some changes. All right. So let's talk, uh, let's talk about the mounting and the plate, I guess. Or do we do story time? We do both. To do both. Let's do story time as I take this apart. All right, so we got our little gasket arenos here. No, actually, I'm going to bamboozle you. Let's, uh... dude, how is this hot dog still here? You are upside down. How are you still there? What is this like hot dog gravity? All right. Let's, uh, let's talk about plate, we'll talk about PCB, then we'll talk about mounting, and then we do story time. So, plate is memes, okay? I'll save you the hassle now. Plate is mostly air. Oh, but Simon, I can see black stuff 
between the, the, the yeah, yeah, just don't worry about it. So most of you are going to be shocked that, oh my God, Simon has actually used bone in this case, silicone, silicone, uh, between the plate and the PCB. Uh, this is because without it, the plate has no supporting structure. It's like unusable, absolutely unusable. Now, I have also requested that we get a normal plate because that'd be great. I, uh, I like uh, when my plates are made out of uh, metal or plastic and not air. So yeah, uh, here we can see little divots, by the way. Uh, those divots in the plate are stamped in in the same way that uh, the Geonworks F1, the original F1 uh, plates worked, where you had your hot dog and the hot dog sat perfectly in the hot dog bun. And we've got one on the top and we've got one on the bottom as well. Now, this particular plate is aluminum and this particular plate, I believe, is meant for this particular hot swap uh, layout. I would not recommend hot swap for a variety of reasons, especially if you're going to go out and buy a board of this caliber. It's not really the best play to go hot swap, but mm, it's all right. So we can see that it is aluminum and looks like low 6000 series or 5000 series, so probably 5053, or it could be... Uh, it wouldn't be 6061 because you can't get it at this thickness. This is a probably a uh, 5053 plate. Could be 5052. It does feel a little bit more rigid than I would expect, so might have a temper on it. Anyway, uh, this is anodized in a gold color. Uh, this is not a brass plate. It's an aluminum plate. It's a very, very flimsy, very light plate, which I'm not the biggest fan of. And uh, basically, any place you can see black is where there is no plate. And that's just uh, custom molded silicone that exists between the plate and PCB assembly. Now, in my original build, uh, I tried building it without the silicone. And uh, it sounded like a radly, echoey, terribly pingy mess. Uh, the uh, designer, Helix R, uh, was watching the live stream twitch.tv slash black simon uh while i was building and he's like bro you should really put the rubber in there and i was like nah it'll be fine yeah turns out you really need the rubber in there so uh one thing to keep out uh to keep an eye out for is during the group buy uh please make sure that there are real plate options like a full plate a solid plate a plate where there isn't a bajillion holes in it that'd be great all right, so that is our plate. Uh, we see our gasket mount tabs. Gasket mount tabs work fine. Essen uh, essentially, they are sandwich gaskets. So you've got hot dog here, hot dog here, smush. There is your gasket mount. Uh, I will at some point take these switches out so we can you know, take a look at everything else. But uh, there isn't much going on with the plate. And you can check it out for yourself. It's, uh, it's, uh, yep. It's a plate with a lot of holes in it. We can see where the slider goes through, essentially. Uh, that's pretty much it. You know, they're acoustic cuts, but then those acoustic cuts get filled in with silicone, which again makes no sense to me. Anyway, uh, I would very much like to have a full plate. That'd be nice. All right. PCB. So PCB has perky RGB because of course it does. And uh, this particular version here is hot swap. Uh, this uses a uh, RP controller, an RP2040. Uh, let's find out on the macro cam. Uh, where am I pointing? Where's my thumb? There it is. Sorry. What are you? RP2, A2. And then I've got additional controllers down here. We've got ourselves uh, a large big boy. 
Unclear what that is. Unclear what that is. There's a lot going on. Uh, I presume that one of these two here are actually used for the slider assembly. And uh, one is used as a bridge between the standard controller and that. But again, reminder, I am not big smart PCB man. I am Simon. All right. So uh, we got ourselves a bottom facing physical reset button. Kind of weird. Normally with a uh, with an RP controller, you'll have a toggle switch so you can toggle to bootloader and back, but fine. Reset switch also works. Uh, not much to see here. Bunch of hot swap sockets, perky RGB, which is really silly on a board like this, but fine, whatever. And we can see where the slider assembly is soldered. Now these are hand soldered because they are so large uh, that they literally just cannot be soldered at the factory. It's a decent feeling slider. Uh, the solder job on it is not amazing on my particular unit. Uh, the assembly sits a little bit too far to the right. You can see that the gap over here is larger than the gap over here. When you hand solder stuff, it's really hard to just get it to sit firmly. Uh, We'll take, we'll take a better look at this once we get all the uh, switches out of this. But uh, daughter board, sorry, uh, PCB is simple besides the daughter board connection over here, which uses a ribbon cable. Uh, very interesting ribbon cable for the record. Uh, it's, it's incredibly like thin and like weighs nothing and will just like bend. Uh, they do send you two, by the way, because these do look a little bit fragile. Uh, but the way in which they assemble or connect is actually pretty cool. So let's check that out. So it connects there. So what you do is you slide it in just like that. It doesn't slide all the way in, by the way, part of the conductive material is still visible, right? And then you close it. It's a little latch. See that? See that little latch? So this is closed, so I can't pull it out. And now it's open and I can pull it out. Let's put it in again. Let's close it. There we go. Closed it and it's in there. It's quite cool. It's quite cool. I like this because it does not take up much space. Uh, it's, it's like acoustic cross section is basically zero. It's not going to affect the sound at all. I mean, like everything affects sound, but like it's, it's impact on sound is going to be basically zero, which is pretty cool. Uh, I did find that it was a teensy bit like flimsy when you hold it, but I've done like, like 10 connections, disconnections, like rebuilds. It's been fine. So I guess it's okay. Uh, all right. Last bit before we start big complaining about stuff is there is a flex cut here that sits basically uh, between your your Z row and your A row. Sorry, your Q row and your A row. And it gives you a little, 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 little tiny bit of flex, which fine. All right. So we'll talk about the mounting as I go through story time. All right. But prior to that, let me finish this coffee off uh, off screen. Alrighty. So I received this a while back and like all of my keyboard reviews, I like to spend a decent amount of time uh, typing on the board to get an idea of, you know, the, the sound, the feel, the little, the little bits that, you know, all add up to make a keyboard good, bad, mediocre, etc. I built this on stream and uh, it was a D subathon stream. If, if you're not familiar with uh, D subathon stream, it's it's like a subathon where when people sub uh, the stream gets longer, but the opposite of that, uh, when uh, people sub the stream gets shorter. Uh, it was still like a three hour stream. And considering that this is a hot swap board, that Simon, how the hell did it take you three and a half hours to build a hot swap board? Well, here's the thing. When I assembled it, 
I was like, okay, that, that was that was a seamless experience besides having to go through and fiddle with all the gaskets and really struggle. Then it sounded kind of weird. It sounded rattly. And I was really confused. And everyone in chat was being like, hey, Simon, your stabs are terrible. You don't know how to do stabs. You're an idiot, Simon. You've, you've never done stabs in your life. It's not like you've built hundreds of keyboards and can literally do stabs in your sleep. No, you totally messed up the stabs, Simon. So I took it apart. Uh, the first build, for the record, was without the silicone piece. So I took it apart. I cleaned up the stabs again, put some more lube in there, you know, and uh, put in the silicone piece, reassembled the whole thing, which is a pain in the ass. I'll walk you through the process, by the way. And it still sounded like really rattly. It sounded like my stabs were like all broken. Now, normally I use my standard cherry clip-in stabs that I get from China. They cost about $5.31 for a TKL kit. Uh, never really had a major problem with them. I had like one stab failure out of like a hundred, which is totally fine. But these particular stabs were not that. These were stabs that I got from Kate because I ran out of stabs. So I presumed, oh, okay, she's just got like really sussy stabs or something. It's fine. I'll get replacement stabs down the line. So we finished up the assembly and all that. So as a sanity check, much, much later, after really struggling, like I took it to work and it just sounded so rattly and I brought it back home. And, you know, just, just to make sure that I wasn't crazy, I had Paul come over. Uh, you guys know Paul, he's the designer of the Buddy, the uh, Type B, the Safa, and some other boards like the Pedals. Anyway, he came over with C3 stab wires. So if you're not familiar with C3 stab wires, C3 stab wires are like amazing. You can buy like, you know, a $5 or like $2 terrible Chinese uh, clip-in stabilizer set. You put in C3 wires, everything's fixed. It's amazing. So he put those in there, uh, he tuned the stabs himself, and then we typed on it. And it was rattly, which uh, was not a fun experience. So at that point, I was like, all right, this board just sounds rattly and terrible. It's fine. I guess that's what it is. I'm going to go type on it at the office and uh, start making my notes as I type on it for the next four weeks. So I started writing down all of my scathing notes. I was furious as to why this sounded so bad. And it made no sense to me. Very few people had assembled these, except for people that got them in the Chinese buy, but I couldn't really find any reliable information of like, how do you make it not sound rattly? So yeah, at that point, I basically started drafting up a, a manifesto to send to Helix, because believe it or not, the purpose of a review is critique, not to just tell people, hey, you should buy this board because money. No. So I started, I started writing it up. Yeah, there we go. Here's our, here's our silicone piece, by the way. Uh, it, it fits very, very well. I would prefer if it wasn't required for a plate like this, but essentially this, this plate weighs nothing. Just, just for reference, so you understand what this plate weighs. Give me a second. It weighs 34 grams. This plate weighs 30, 34 grams. A space bar weighs six. That's like four space bars. Five or six space bars. You get the idea. It's really, really light. So I started. I, I started. I started just typing, 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 typing all all my issues with the board, which we're gonna go through. Okay. Turns out, interestingly enough, that the scarab, uh, when you type on the board, the scarab moves around because it's basically held in by hopes and dreams. And you know what the scarab sounds like? It sounds like rattly stabs. I know you guys can't hear that, but here, just, just so you guys hear it, let me, let me get my mic nice and close. I know that this is the incorrect mic, 
Don't consider this a proper sound test. We'll get to that. So, uh, yeah, uh, I came to the realization that the, uh, the scarab was the sound of the rattle all along, which nobody told me about. Uh, I figured it out after a while. Uh, I had spoken to Frank, Frank the Tank, uh, who is, I believe, the only other person who streamed a build. It took me five free builds to figure it out. It also took him five rebuilds to figure it out. We both rebuilt our boards five times to get an idea of w w what the heck have we done wrong? We can't possibly be that bad. So anyway, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's do my notes that I sent to Helix because that will also discuss mounting as well. So. I sent him bit by bit as I would basically write my own notes for a video like this and went through each individual portion. First portion was case, uh, case and fitment. I told him, hey, listen, finishing, very well done. There are some machining marks visible through the, uh, uh, through the electroplate of the PVD back piece on the interior, just the interior. And uh, for each of these, I'll give you a response from Helix if there is a response. So they've made alterations already during the Chinese buy where the inner surfaces are now sandblasted prior to PVD, which is great. Now, <clears throat> I said a fully flat case bottom may not be great for sound, which I covered later in the sound portion, but just keep a mental note. Uh, the other thing I said is the daughter board USB connector depth is a little deeper than most boards. And moving the daughter board or USB connector a little closer to the outside would help with custom cable compatibility. And Helix said, okay, we'll try to move the USB port about half a millimeter or a millimeter forward in future batches, which is great because that's all you really need to basically get custom cables in there. I also said that the scarab fitment is very problematic. It can easily fall out while being carried in a case and then just scratch the shit out of your case. And they said, Scarab is being worked on, which we'll cover later as well. <clears throat> and then I complained about the silver screws. I told them why. And they said that we'll change those six screws for uniformity. They didn't think it mattered that much due to them being on the inside of the case. But again, this is a $580, at least this version, 65%. <clears throat> there should be no cut corners. I want all the screws to be gold. All right. In terms of <clears throat> PCB and electricals, I said that on my unit, the slider is misaligned by like 0.2 millimeters. This, is, this can cause sound issues, by the way, like especially if it starts contacting this or, you know, if it's at an angle. Uh, the reason why the scarab makes the sound just sound so rattly is because the entirety of the vibrations of the PCB basically radiate through this little point here. It acts as like, as like a little tuning fork. So, like, if you type and you touch this, you can feel everything. So, loose scarab, kind of annoying. This being offset just the, the tiniest bit, also very annoying. And then uh, the response was that all the faders are hand soldered. They can be done uh, via SMT because it needs to be inserted into the board instead of just placing it up top. The alignment is done with three pins and three corresponding holes. And like they've done what they can, but TLDR, they can't do much more in terms of alignment. Realistically, if you get one and you notice that, you know, it's not sitting perfectly flat, you could desolder and solder it. It's three solder points. 
All right. Uh, pa, 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 pa. I told them that the daughter board clasp and a uh, little cable is cool, but the cable is very stiff. I've done at that point five rebuilds and the cable kind of looks like it might break soon. Uh, but they said, yeah, we're always going to include an extra cable just so people have it. Uh, doing it without tweezers helps a bit. Uh, for future projects, they might change the cable type, but for the RO65, basically, you're just going to get two cables. And to be fair, two cables is fine. You don't need more than two cables. All right, uh, next, mounting and feel. Now, the mounting force seems pretty hard, okay? Now, these gaskets themselves, these guys, these hot dogs are, are hard, dude. These are hard. I don't have a, a durometer. Uh, like a hardness tester, but these feel like 70A to 80A. They're they're tough, dude. These are very tough. And keep in mind that essentially you have 80A under an 80A on top as well. So it's 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 a it's 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 rough. So I said, hey, could could you offer something a little softer? They said yes, it's possible. Uh also looking at pour on for a rubber alternative. Uh whether or not this actually makes it to this round of group buy that's coming up soon. Unclear. But Softer gaskets would be nice. Uh, a plate that doesn't literally weigh nothing would also be nice. And I said that the overall feel and sound is consistent, but a standard full plate would be nice as the, this is just not great. And they said that we're waiting to test and compare sounds with a full plate without cutouts and PC plates, etc. We'll try a full plate works without silicone in terms of sound. Ultimately, the depression height of the plate as a whole is limited by the depth of those hot dog channels. Changing hot dog materials from silicone to poron may provide additional softness. Yeah. Still, I'd like real plate options. All right. Now, there was a sound section. Sound section went as follows. It took me five free bills to figure out that the loose carob was causing the sound of the board to sound like rattly stabs. I told him a small silicone insert between the slider stem and scarab would be the best solution for this, or modifying the bottom of the scarab to allow for a tighter pressure fit. So uh, basically a V-shape instead of a straight shape. So when you shove it in there, it like really holds on. Uh, I said that the slider stem can also bend during assembly and disassembly. Uh, basically, if you don't take the plate PCB assembly straight from the top, and you bend it a little bit, the case will actually bend this, uh, this, uh, I don't know what this is called slider stem, I guess. Uh, also said a fully flat bottom piece, maybe, uh, maybe the culprit for the loud and echoey sound of the keyboard. Have you experimented with grill cuts or adding any sort of complexity on the bottom to try and resolve this? Uh, and then I said that the stock plate full of holes is relatively high pitched and sound reflective. So can we get something like this that isn't terrible? And then finally, I said that the flex cut in the PCB is good because I'll show you guys that you can actually notice the uh, benefit from this. However, having a silicone insert or tape or something to at least fill that hole would be great. And then the responses were uh, Scarab. Yes, Scarab will be redone. Uh, as a matter of fact, Scarab is going to be redone for all the Chinese units. There were 300 units sold in China and all of them are getting replacement Scarabs, which is going to be a long and costly endeavor, but at the very least they're going back and fixing it for everyone because the Radley Scarab issue literally destroys the board. Uh, I was able to resolve it by taking a piece of paper, just an A4 piece of paper and shoving it in there and then closing it and it was fine, but we shouldn't have to do that for a $580 board. All right, so uh, in terms of this bending, uh, Helix's response was simply skill issue, just have skill and don't bend it while disassembling it. Uh, for uh, grill or more complex bottoms, they will try prototyping. Uh, I doubt it's something we're going to see in the uh, current group buy round, but hopefully in the future. Uh, whether or not it's required, whether or not it helps remains to be seen. And then, uh, pa, 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 pa. so uh, whole plate is possible and plastic plate is possible. So hopefully we actually get real plates, please, dear God.
And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, I also complained about no hard case. And I had a extended discussion with Helix R about a hard case. My logic was, hey, listen, you, you, you've gone all wild with like all these engravings and you've got a theme and the theme works like it's a it's a cool theme. How have you not designed like a super like super nice hard case, like a bitch in hard case? Like you don't have to sell it with the board. You don't have to sell it at a normal hard case price of like twenty dollars. If you're going to do like, you know, raised portions and all of that, you can you can sell a fifty dollar hard case as long as, you know, it's really nice for fifty dollars. So they'll try. Basically, uh, it turns out that having like like parts that come out on a hard case are kind of hard to do. And considering MOQs, like they'd have to make like a thousand of them and that thousand, they're not going to sell a thousand of these. I mean, it'd be nice if they sold a thousand of these, but hard case would be nice. For the time being, if you are a buyer and you buy one of these, just pick up a Canon Keys hard case or something like that. But I really think it's a huge missed opportunity that the Helix has not made like a hieroglyph hard case. Like, look. Could this design like th they have the design aspects like they've got like the de design ideology just just make a hard case just make a hard case anyway so that was all the responses from helix now like i said earlier a review should be a review it should be a critique and a good maker is the maker that will take your critique and actually act upon it with the goal of actually making an improved product which based on helix's response is what i see happening which is great uh how much of that will actually get for this group buy round i'm not sure at the very least the major issue the scarab is confirmed resolved uh and then some smaller things like oh the screws are the wrong colors also resolved but for, you know, the little sound tuning things that will probably take time, that will probably take multiple variations for them to figure it out. I understand that, you know, they've been working on this for like two years and it is time for an international group buy. So let's put this together. And as I put this together, I'll walk you through basically the assembly process. So part one is you, for this plate, absolutely need the silicone. There's no way around it. There is no way around it. The nice thing though is it fits pretty snugly. Like once once you get the alignment, it'll just drop into place basically. Sure wish I got the alignment. Oh, there we go. There we go. Perfect. Now I am using uh, Vertex V1 switches, which are switches that I have not really used in the past. I'm not gonna go into detail about them here. I'll go into detail uh, on my next review, which will be the Canon Keys Brutal 1800 V2, where I use these switches as well. I think they they like they worked really well on that. On this one, I don't know if they worked well or not because this this like. All the sound issues I had from this board, at least now, it sounds fine. I don't want to, you know, go and blame the switches and whatnot. Uh, these are made by JWK. These are JWIX. They do not use JWK molds. These are fully custom molds. Uh, top, bottom, and stem are fully custom. And they're factory lubed in the 30 cents. I like them. I uh, like the springs were not my favorite, but then again... You know, like a lot of people ask me, hey, Simon, what did you think of them? And I'm like, they were great, but the, the springs are kind of terrible. And then they gave me a logical response, which is, hey, name one like like stock switch that has a, a good stock spring. So, yeah, fair point. Fair point. I don't know. I feel like if you're going to do fully custom molds at that point, at least at least get better springs. All right, so... Assembly wise, these switches uh, click very firmly into the plate, even this like terribly sussy plate that's made out of air, but they clip in very, very well. Uh, generally, that's very, very important. Otherwise, you'll end up with crooked switches and you're not going to have a good time. Of course, 
when the group buy comes around, please, 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 everybody make sure that there are options for real plates, as in plates not made out of air. Because I understand that, you know, this was originally designed for the Chinese market, hence the perky RGB and like all the memes and like a hot swap as default. Uh, for the record, I think you'll have the option between hot swap and solder, like without paying extra. But, you know, the Western market, especially when we're looking at something of this price point, I don't know where I visualize this as a very high end board. I visualize this as like one of the most high end 65s possible because from like a visual standpoint, from a functionality standpoint, from a mounting standpoint, from like all of that, like you, you've got to be at the highest level to, you know, request the price that you are requesting, especially for the divine edition. But as long as the full plates that I hope are included in the group buy. Give me a second, I got a cat here. Okay, come on, buddy. Come on, buddy. All right, we got it. All right, so as long as a full plate is offered or a real plate is offered and it's made by the same manufacturer that does this plate, I assume the tolerances are going to be just as tight, which means your switches are going to clip in just fine. Normally, I'm kind of afraid when it comes to hot swap, uh, when it comes to hot swap builds and hot swap uh, PCBs is like uh, you look at something like the uh, like the uh, the sand glass uh, ergo where the plate was incapable of holding the switches in place which then meant if you were trying to take your caps off, you ended up taking your switch out. And if your switch is that easy to take out, that means it's not firmly in place, which means there are, there are like acoustic consequences of that. If it physically is like rattling the teensiest bit in there, you're going to hear that. Maybe not directly, but you'll, you'll get the premise of, hmm, something doesn't sound right. Something sounds a little inconsistent. You know, is my board rattly? Are my stabs bad? Am I bad at building? No, you just have a plate that isn't capable of holding your switches firmly. Anyway, uh, PCB wise, never really had a problem with this PCB. Uh, I I did a uh, I did an oopsie poopsie where I hit a key combo that inverted my uh, my uh, left control and left win, or in my case, left win and left alt, but. Apparently, that was just a key combo. Uh, PCB supports VIA. Uh, RGB seems to work fine uh, in terms of me going into VIA and turning it off. That worked fine. So, yeah. Uh, cannot complain. Cannot complain. Now, uh, this little guy right here, uh, they sent me the, uh, the user manual for how do you make this work. And essentially, you have to download some sort of software, and then like you have to get your computer to see it as a MIDI device. Then you need to have another piece of software where you can like map it so like it actually like can do volume control or stuff like that. So yeah, I did none of that. Uh, when I get my like actual like group by uh, unit, maybe I'll go through the effort. Uh, it would be really really nice if we had QMK or via you know support for actual analog potentiometers that'd be great uh i know that you know there are many many ways of handling it but like i just wish i could use it interestingly enough during usage the amount of times that i would try to use this as page up page down just naturally without thinking about it where i'd be on a page and i just want to scroll down the page and i'd use this without even thinking about it so it'd be really cool if we could get something like that natively within VIA, if, you know, we we could support the hardware. That'd be amazing. Instead of, you know, needing VIA for this part, and then you need something else for this part. But yeah, that is, uh, that is my two cents. All right, so we have got our assembly fully assembled, our plate PCB assembly. So how do we actually put this together? All right, here we go. So part one. You get your top piece and you put it upside down, okay? You get out all your long hot dogs, okay? Not to be confused with your short hot dogs, okay? It's very important, long hot dog. Get your 
long hot dogs here. You put it in all the holes right there. You want to make sure that they're not popping out from one side to the other because the amount of force that actually sandwiches this is kind of hardcore. So there's our six hot dogs. Perfect. So our six hot dogs are done. What do we do now? Well, now we can drop the plate PCB assembly right onto the hot dogs. All right. And we want to make sure that the slider actually goes through the hole. You can tell that it's not. Hello. All right. Pull it out. Let's try and get the slider in the thing first. There we go. Okay. So yeah, slider stem kind of really annoying to deal with, but just make sure that you get it through. All right. Now that we've done that, the next step is to arrange the rest of the hot dogs. So what I like to do is use the back piece here, which has the small hot dogs. So this would, oh, well, we just dropped a bunch of hot dogs, which is fine, but I'm missing one. All right. Well, at some point we're going to find it. So our goal is to get these small little hot dogs in place. Uh, I like to use tweezers for this just to like struggle a little bit harder. There we go. No, small little hot dogs. They go right on the ridges. So there are small little ridges right there that are perfectly hot dog sized. I feel like I have lost one and I have no idea where it is. We'll cross that bridge when we get to it. So you get your small hot dogs on the ridges. You try and align them as best you can. Okay. There we go. All the hot dogs are in place. Mm. All right. I'm just making sure that I didn't lose a random hot dog inside the assembly because that would suck. All right, then what do we do? We get this piece on. We try and come straight down as to not disturb the hot dogs, like so. And it flies out. Perfect. So now we repeat what we did again. Again, hot dogs going to hot dog holes. So you got to be really, really careful when you put this piece on, because if anything is like misaligned, then you're not going to have a good time. It's going to sound weird. It's going to feel weird. And it's probably not going to fit together. All right, let's try again. So again, this piece comes down. Like so. Perfect. All right, I'm going to hold this with one hand. I'm going to grab one of these long screws. Which I'm praying is the correct screw. I'm going to try and close this with my non dominant hand. All right, so we got it a little screwed in, which is perfect. We're just trying to hold the top right now as we go and work on the bottom. Now, the bottom relies on these little clamps right here. So the clamps are directional. You can see that one side is filleted and the other side is just a hard corner. So that tells us which direction they go in. On the opposite side, that being the bottom, you can see that there's a little spacer here. That spacer makes it so you actually use two small hot dogs in this landing area. So I'll demonstrate using the middle hot dog mounting point. I can find my tweezers. There they are. So what we do is we put a hot dog to the left, we put a hot dog to the right, and we make sure that that matches up with our little gap here. And then we drop it in. We use our silver screws, which should be gold screws on the group by variant. We do a little screw in on one side, we do a little screwing on the other side. All right, just to make sure that it's held in place and we're okay. So we've done this. Now we got to do that two more times. 
I'll do that two more times, and I am absolutely missing a hot dog for the record. It could be anywhere. Ah, there we go. And there we go. Again, making sure to leave a gap in the middle. Then we come in with our clamp, make sure it's facing the right way. Like that. Drop it into place. Again, I'm not going to fully screw this in hard. Just, just trying to catch the thread. Okay. And you guys may notice that I put this in backwards. This is the bottom, not the top. So we take it out again. We make sure that the hot dogs are still in place. Okay. And we put the clamp in correctly this time. And then we screw it in. See, some of you may think that I did that on purpose. No. This is, this is difficult to put together, even with a lot of experience. All right, so I have one hot dog, and I need two hot dogs. Any hot doggers? Any hot doggers? Okay. Did I drop it on me? No. Okay, we have a single hot dog there. Hmm. So, where hot dog? Where hot dog? Where hot dog? Hot dog where? See, working on a black desk mat ah, makes it hard to find a black hot dog. All right, we got it. Again, we drop it into place. Trying to keep adequate spacing, like so. We come in with our clamp, we make sure that it's not upside down this time. There we go. And clamp assembly. So normally I don't walk through the build like this, but for a board like this, it's kind of important that you have an idea of here is how it fits together. All right, so basically I've only half tightened all of these. I'm going to go in and basically Screw in the rest of the screws for the for the back portion of the mount. In the same way that you would screw in a tire, you want to kind of do it radi radially, so you you know keep some sort of uh, distribution without pinching any of the gaskets or anything like that. So I'm kind of just like going through, tightening a little bit, going through, tightening a little bit. I'm also I'm also feeling to see if uh, anything feels weird. If anything feels weird, it means that, you know, your gasket may have slipped and you want to unscrew that bit, check your gasket, screwing it, and then screw it in again. Uh, if you just yellow it, you're probably not going to have a good time. It's quite complex when it comes to its assembly in terms of does the, does the complexity offer any benefit? Absolutely not. But hey. It is a design choice and using clamped top mount gasket, sandwich gasket is fine. If you are a designer and you want to use it, go for it. All right, so there we go. We got our mount fully mounted. So at this point, we can just close it up essentially. And uh, yeah. All right, so while I do that, I'll talk about the, uh, the typing sound and the typing feel. Now, I'm going to give you these notes based on the assumption that a lot of changes are going to be made, notably to the scarab issue. So the typing feel is a little bit harder than I would like. And I know this sounds like deja vu because I say that about every single board that isn't hilariously flexy. But taking into account the mounting type, it's a little stiff for its mounting type. And that can be resolved by getting softer, uh, softer hot dogs, just slightly softer hot dogs, you know, it's the teensy, teensy bit, because the whole point of a gasket is one isolation and two, a little bit of bounce. And it, there isn't too much bounce on this board. There's the teensiest bit. So, uh, the bounce that you get is the bounce in which, uh, your bottom outs don't feel as harsh as they would on a top mount, but you don't get any actual bounce bounce. So it's a little on the stiff side. I'd go, I'd possibly go with like, if we have an option, uh, a softer 
uh, plastic plate. I think it would benefit a lot from it. Or at the very least, you know, a softer bottoming out feeling switch. Something like Nixie's, uh, Milky Tops. Something that isn't going to bottom out super harsh is what I would recommend. All right, so we're nearly done. We just got to get the back on. By that, I mean the bottom. In terms of typing sound, uh, once you've resolved the, uh, the scarab issue, sounds okay, okay? Sounds a little bit hollow. And that might be due to the bottom just being perfectly flat. Doesn't sound absurdly hollow. And when I say hollow, hollow could be a good thing. Hollow could be a bad thing. Uh, having a hollow sounding board means you get a boomier sound. If we look at something like the Jaguar, the Jaguar sounds hollow. Does it sound hollow in a bad way? No, but it does sound hollow. Uh, I am by no means comparing this to the Jaguar sound because the Jaguar sound is amazing. The sound of this is acceptable at best. I think that with enough effort, you can make this board sound acceptable. I don't think with all the tuning in the world, you couldn't make this board sound great. But again, sound is open to interpretation. Everybody has their preference. I do like how boomy it sounds. Uh, I just, just part of me wishes that the bottom was not perfectly flat so we could at least, you know, get some sort of benefit out of it. All right, so here we are. We have assembled our Aru. And we've uh, basically talked about sound and feel, have we not? Let me check my notes. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, I'll put this together. We will do a typing test, but uh, uh, prior to that, this might end up being a lot like the, uh, the angle TKL situation in which the original thing that I review uh, ends up being wildly different from the actual international version. So uh, I will be picking up an international version, a group by version uh, in solder layout in a color that I like, uh, preferably with a real plate. And uh, I will be reviewing that as well. Uh, it'll be the same type of review where it'll be a differential review of here are the differences. So I'm not gonna re-review it from scratch. Uh, this video is intentionally longer than usual to account for the fact that here's the board and here's the expected changes from there. There will be a video in which I say, hey, they made the expected changes or they didn't make the expected changes and here's why. All right, so I'll see you guys on typing test. So keep in mind, those of you that just listened to the sound test, uh, the scarab issue is an issue you should not have. It is something that should be resolved in the group by run, but you can tell how oof it is. 
So I'm very sorry to everybody that was in the Chinese buy and anybody that has a pre-production unit of this. Uh, it is easily solvable for the record. You just put a little piece of tissue, a little piece of paper in there and just make sure that it fits firmly as to not rattle. Anyway, summary time. The summary is as follows. Helix has been incredibly responsive and incredibly open to all of my notes and, you know, all of my impressions. That makes them objectively a very good maker because they're willing to listen to criticism and actually make improvements. So hopefully there should be a large amount of improvements on the group I run of the RU65. I, for one, really like the board. Uh, I am not keeping this version because it's pre-production and because it's black. I will be purchasing a purple Divine Edition. Now, uh, during the group buy run, uh, at least it was previously planned that you cannot pick your special color. You can either pick silver or black or random. Uh, please, uh, if you are interested in purchasing one in one of the nicer colors, and I'll, I'll link... Uh, a, uh, a gallery of the nicer colors below in the description. Please push for those to be buyable options. We should be able to buy the things that we like. Uh, aside from that, it's a unique board. It's probably one of the nicest looking 65s ever made for me personally, maybe not in this colorway, but for me personally. Just like I said with the original Aru, this is a board where if you like the design, you're gonna go for it and you're gonna you're gonna love it. And if you don't like the design, then it's fine. Anyway, the original Aru TKL had glaring sound issues. And to be fair, the Aru 65 has improved. It doesn't have glaring sound issues, with the exception of the scarab, which should be resolved. Uh hopefully Helix makes all the changes that we need changed, and I'm pretty sure they will. Uh, they've been very responsive and they're willing to retroactively go back and fix all of the Chinese group buy units. That's 300 plus units, which is good to see. It's good to see a maker that actually cares. Uh, from a price point perspective, the base version is 430 bucks, which is fine. The dual layer anodized divine edition is $580, which is fine. Uh, I will be buying one. I will find the money and I will absolutely buy one. Uh, I know that this review has been long, but this review basically covers all of my uh, specific problems and all of the specific responses from Helix for all of those problems. So if you are interested in this board, I do recommend you actually sit through the whole review. I know it's long. Just grab some coffee and, uh, I don't know, play some chess or something. Anyway, so my RO review, this, I, I like this board. The, that's basically it. I like this board. I am buying it. Need I say more? It's a fantastic board. I don't even like 65s. This is the first 65 that I have liked in many, many, many years. Uh, it'd be really nice if I could use this analog slider to actually issue via or QMK commands or key codes. That'd be great. Uh, maybe someday we just need uh, big, smart PCB people to do big, smart things and allow me to do, uh, allow me to scroll using this because that would be amazing. Anyway, uh, thank you all for watching. If, uh, if you like long form, super in-depth keyboard reviews and you want to see more of them, uh, subscribe, leave a like, uh, hop in our discord or come catch me on stream where the vibe is a little bit different on stream. Uh, it's more fun and less educational, but you'll still learn something along the way. So yeah, thanks for watching my review. Goodbye.